Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Buddy Seth I'm the Vice President for Students Equity and Success here at Shoreline Community College. And it is my great honor uh, to welcome and introduce uh, the moderator of tonight's discussion, uh, Lourdes Alvarado Ramos, uh, who is the Director of the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, as director, uh, she prefers to be called Alfie, um, but I, I will tell you a little bit of background about her and, and how she came into this role. Uh, she was born in Puerto Rico and served 22 years on active duty in the U.S. Army. And she retired as the Command Sergeant Major of Madigan Army Medical Center and Troop Command at Joint Base Lewis McCord. And as director, uh, she serves as a member of Governor Jay Inslee's executive cabinet and chairs the Washington State Military Transition Council. In this capacity, uh, her agency leads statewide efforts for the seamless transition of members of the military to Washington State's communities. And she also serves as the lead for the governor's health and healthy and safe communities goal council, which is charged with fostering the health of Washingtonians from a healthy start to a safe and supported future. Alfie is the recipient of the Army Legion of Merit Medal and the Military Order of Medical Merit and state and national awards, a multitude of state and national awards. And uh, in particular, the Governor's Distinguished Management Leadership Award and the Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary's Leadership Award. Director Alma Ramos will introduce the members of the panel that we have seated here. And I wanted to say thank you to those, both for your service and for uh, your service tonight and helping us talk about this very important topic. Um, if you will help me give a warm shoreline welcome to uh, Director Alfie Alvarado Ramos. I'm going to stand in front of the podium because if I stand behind, you're not going to see me. <laughs> you know, so I just want to make sure that, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being here because the weather is not very good and some of you came from uh, outside of the college and uh, it's really appreciated that you took time to be able to join this incredible group of people, most of whom I know and have known for some time and I will tell you, they had a great transition from the military service into the community. And you're going to be hearing the stories. And they're very heartwarming stories and uh, you know things that need to be taken in consideration to make sure that if you yourself are, are, is, are not a, if you're not a veteran, but you know veterans, or you go to a place of worship where you have peers who may have sons, daughters, you know, or neighbors who are vets, what you learn here could be something that you can use in the community and somewhere along the line you're going to save a life. I can tell you that you will be able to make a referral or say a word of encouragement. You are going to be saving a life. So listen to these people closely because they have some really great stories and in the process you will be able to know how to be able to help maybe somebody who is in that. You know, in need of assistance. So I'm going to start in the order that they're seated, uh, introducing them. Because if I let them introduce themselves, we're going to be here all night. <laughs> so we'll just, you know, I'll do that. So first, we're going to start with John McCoy. Joy, uh, John McCoy, uh, U.S. Army National Guard Reserve, Washington State. He received an honorable discharge in 2010. John entered the military eight days after 9/11. John sir. John served two deployments as an infantryman in Baghdad and Mosul, Iraq. He was awarded a combat infantry badge and an Army Commendation Medal for his service. He's a Wounded Warrior Fellow and former Veterans Case Worker with Washington State 9th Congressional District. He also worked with us at the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs for a little while. So we know him pretty well. Between his two tours in Iraq, John volunteered with the Army National Guard to help conduct search and rescue and provide security throughout the lower ninth ward of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. As a life member with the Veterans of Foreign Wars, he continues to help veterans reach vital services in their time of need. 
John has served, is, he currently serves in the King County Veterans Board, and as you, I think you probably know, the King County, the citizens of King County did approve a human services and veterans levy that is going to provide incredibly important services to veterans and their families in King County. Yeah, so that's the introduction of your mother. So please, let's <laughs> Sylvia Feliciano entered the military in 1991, the U.S. Marine Corps, what? <laughs> and, served as a, and served as an administrator with the first radio battalion in Hawaii following basic training. She served in a, on a humanitarian assistance team in Miami, Florida, following damage from Hurricane Andrew. Her long hours of support for Marines deployed from North Carolina earned her a meritorious award. She was the first woman Marine to serve on the color guard of a Dolphins football game. You know, and I tell you, you know, those are really guarded positions, you know, to be color guard at uh, some of the NFL. Currently, Sylvia is a strategic advisor and the systems lead for the Development Services Office City of Seattle Public Utilities. Currently, Sylvia, uh, one of her priorities there is to create a pipeline for transitioning veterans in the city. She works closely with HR managers to translate military occupational posts to city-like job classifications and works with former military personnel who are entering the civilian workforce. Sylvia Feliciano. <laughs> and we have one of your own, Arvin Ferrolino. Yes. Hey, sure. line student. Arvin entered the military U.S. Army in 2009 and completed basic training before being Georgia. He spent seven years in the infantry, including a tour of in Germany, then another in Afghanistan, 2010-2011, then back to Germany. He finished his service at Fort Lewis, Washington as a sergeant. He was born in Salinas, California, but realized quickly how much better life is in Washington, <laughs> where he chose to remain and attend school following his military career, career, and I know he's a proud student of this college. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, we're the, we have the senior most member of this August panel. That means Larry, the oldest. <laughs> Larry Alcantara served with the 5th Communication Battalion, 3rd Marine Division, 10 miles southeast of Da Nang the Republic of Vietnam, from November 1967 to September 1968. And I look at Larry and I go, he doesn't look that way. <laughs> <laughs> he does not look, you know? Yes. Serving veterans and serving those who serve, you know, keeps him young, I think. Yes. He was honorably discharged 20 September 1968. Larry served on several volunteer boards for community-based organizations for cultural heritage, performing arts, human services, and political action. He serves on the Governor's Veterans Affairs Advisory Committee as the Vice Chair. He has also served in the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation Outreach Committee, Leatherneck Honor Guard Commander, and his past commander, Puget Sound Marine Corps League. He spent 27 years in corporate HR for the city of Seattle. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Alcantara. Okay, so I have a series of questions that I'm going to be asking them, and uh, some of them are going directed directed at them. But there is going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions of them. So just kind of think about some of those questions that you may have, and I'm going to kind of pass halfway through, just to make sure that we catch up and then pick up again, and uh, we will finish uh, the questions. And you know, at the end, we'll have another opportunity just to be able to catch up. Okay. So we're going to start, you know, uh, in whatever or whoever starts first. But I'd like for each one of you to be able to briefly describe your transition from the military to the civilian community. Who would like to start? Uh, I'll start. I was released from uh, active duty in September of 1968. Uh, I actually came from Vietnam onto a uh, commercial airline, landed at Alcoro, California. 
and all I had to do was take my medical and I had my walking paper. So I went straight from the jungle back to the streets of Seattle. At that time, Seattle was in a recession. By 1971, Boeing had laid off 70% of their workforce. There were no jobs to be had. There used to be a big billboard around Seattle that said, last one to leave Seattle, please turn out the lights. Uh, so it was really tough getting the job. Of course, our country was quite polarized over the war. And so uh, veterans were not viewed favorably. Uh, I would get very strange questions during job interviews. How many people did you kill? And, you know, were you addicted, addicted to drugs? And, and uh, it was kind of a, a difficult time. So that transition for me was somewhat difficult. Uh, we weren't welcomed home with open arms. Uh, it was better we didn't uh, talk about our military service or, or use any of that. So I kicked around, uh, did whatever jobs I could find, working in a warehouse, uh, washing dishes in a nursing home, working as an aide to the handicapped. Uh, but finally, I ran into a VA counselor and he referred me to Washington State Employment Security uh, for a job as a job interviewer. That was in 1972, some four years after I was released from active duty. I went from that job to the city of Seattle and uh, finished a 31-year career in public service. So, um, my feeling is uh, both the military and the civilians should have and could have provided some structure to help uh, those moving from military culture to civilian culture. Uh, I really wasn't prepared to go from the jungle to the streets of Seattle in a matter of a couple of weeks. It, it was really a culture shock. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get into some of the details and some of the challenges, but I'll leave it there for now. Uh, my my uh, transition from military to civilian was a lot easier than compared to Larry's. Uh, I got out in 2016, so by then, uh, you know, the Army had lessons learned from the past and applied those lessons learned. And the, um, I actually transitioned twice. Uh, once, my first one is 2012. Uh, back then, it was ACAP. So ACAP provide. Uh, resources for veterans that's getting ready to get out, like 12 months out of uh, process. Uh, they help us uh, search for jobs, help us uh, job interview, help us uh, build our resume to fit into the civilian world. Um, and, and with that, uh, they also provide us with uh, resources, with health uh, benefits, and get us ready to uh, prepare us to go to school. And uh, back then, they didn't have a program uh, like we have in 2016 where they have a uh, transition veteran that's about to get out. And we have this program, apprenticeship program, which I don't want, from what I remember from my soldier, uh, one of them is in Fort Lewis was welding and HVAC. Those are the main thing that they offer for veterans that's getting out in about six months. So, uh, they'll uh, apply for a program, and once they get uh, approved, and the uh, unit would let them go to do that class until they get out to prepare for to have a job. So that's one of them, and um, and one of them is school. Uh, GI Bill, uh, they taught us how to uh, navigate the system and how to apply school um, wherever you want to go. Um, those are one of them, and um, my my transition wasn't as bad as compared to Larry's, uh, because we are given uh, the resources uh, for us to be successful when we get out. But the only thing they didn't give us is um, we're given all these resources, but when we get out, we're not prepared to be back in the real world because there's a disconnect between. A, the civilians and the military. So that's why while attending here, uh, when they ask me about my service, I share just a little bit just to get them 
to know that, hey, you could actually approach a veteran uh, you know, at any time. You can talk to me at any time. I'm willing to answer any question. And yeah, that, that was my transition. It wasn't as hard as Larry. Uh, I was given everything that I need to, to know to be successful uh, in the civilian world. That's it. Um, well, I got out, um, it was shortly after the Gulf War, and um, they didn't have a successful transition program <laughs> during my time. I was in Hawaii, and um, um, we had the um, the choice to go whenever we wanted to go, and I think I went like five days before I was um, separating. I didn't realize the, the importance of it, um, but it was just passing us through the door. We were handed a packet of bad copies, and we were given like a personality test, and I didn't know what it meant. I was 19 years old, and um, the career counseling um, conversation that I had was um, uninformative. It was didn't inform me of anything. It, did, it certainly didn't prepare me to go into the real world, um, into the civilian world. Um, there was no resume, um, translation of skill sets, no transferable skill sets, um, no interview practice or um, job search help. There, there wasn't any. It was just pushing us out the door. You know, a checklist. We got her through. Um, so it was pretty. It was pretty difficult. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, we've changed things, and it's so important to to create that pipeline between the civilian workforce and, and the military transitioning officers that are helping veterans come out. Um, I got out uh, a few months after my last deployment. I got back from Mosul. I was a National Guardsman my whole time, so I actually went through a transition twice. Uh, when I got back in 2005, I went off active duty into the National Guard again. I ended up working for the Seattle Times for a little while. I had a great time there. Um, my, uh, my second time, I, I was actually stop lost. I was just a few days, about eight days from getting out of the military. Uh, really excited to tell my company commander, thanks but no thanks, I'm not signing any more paperwork. And uh, that's when he told me, you're really gonna hate me. And then I ended up doing another two years, uh, uh, over uh, about a year and a half over in combat over in Mosul. And uh, when I got back, uh, the difference between 2005 and 2010, uh, 2005 when I was out processing, it was really quick, very little oversight. Um, I don't think the government was quite prepared um, for that uh, type of uh, transition. It's been a long time since we've been in combat. Um, in 2010, those services were a lot more. There was just a lot more out processing, a lot more thorough. But I'm very, I was a very proud infantryman, and I was uh, having a very difficult time asking for help. I just wanted out of the military as quick as possible. When I got out, I had uh, some significant uh, issues with uh, PTSD. Um, I also uh, sustained injuries in Iraq, and I have a traumatic brain injury. Um, and uh, I had some really big breakdowns. And uh, my brother, who was also a disabled veteran, was pleading for me to get help. And, uh, and it didn't, I would say, another couple months went by, and my friend uh, who I went to a baseball game with, he was a Marine, uh, I actually saw him in Kuwait as he was going into Iraq, and I was coming out of the guy since I was 11. Uh, I was in a baseball game with him, and he told me he was going to therapy. And when I heard that, to hear, it's just, hear a peer of mine, somebody that I really respect, somebody I love, saying that he was doing therapy, that's when I finally called up the vet center uh, down in Seattle. A uh, gentleman named Ron Boxmeyer, who was just a hero of mine, uh, said, get down here. He's a Vietnam vet. He does a lot of great things for veterans. And he got me down there and, and got me on the uh, path to healthy, uh, healthy lifestyle. Um, good year of therapy. I've done three uh, years. I go, I go back every occasion. But uh, after I was able to get healthy with myself and start uh, moving forward, that's when I came to school here. I met my wife here. Um, and uh, I'm just really grateful that there's uh, some really great veteran to veteran therapy uh, out there. You know, a lot of people say that, and I say that too, the services and programs that our new uh, veterans enjoy were built on the shoulders of the Vietnam vet. Because many of us, you know, as we uh, went into the workforce and started working with veterans, uh, swore that we would never let happen what happened to us. And I say us, I served during Vietnam, I uh, went in 1971, but as a medic working in hospitals, you can imagine, you see all kinds of things when it comes to being able to care 
of, you know, for the Vietnam veteran after they have been in during combat. You know, so, so it is wonderful that there are new programs and they're going to continue improving just to make sure that we take really good care of our veterans. In retrospect, you know, and it's not going to be all of you, but whoever I would like to answer this question, what kind of support would have been especially helpful from educational institutions like Shoreline or veteran services agencies, you know, for to be able to ease that transition? Oh. Uh, for uh, here in Seattle, actually, uh, have a lot of program for that. Um, uh, if you know, if you decided to go to school, uh, you could actually go to your closest community college, uh, which we uh, have a veteran uh, representative there that would uh, provide you with uh, that information you need to actually get your school GI Bill started. And if you're not ready yet, you could actually go to uh, the Vet Center is one of them. Uh, the Vet Center also, we actually uh, provide information in regards to GI Bill, like uh, get you the process, uh, get them uh, like all the information that you need uh, in order for you to uh, to get your school started. Um, from what I know, when I started, I just, when I, I was still in, I went to Everett Vet Center. I mean, Everett Community College, that was the first college that I attended to. And I just walked in there, I saw Science is Veteran, uh, Veterans Program. So I went in there, like, hey man, um, I want to go to school. Uh, knowing this, I already know about the GI Bill, but I wasn't sure uh, during my TAPS. So uh, one day I just decided. One day um, it was actually when uh, when I took one of my soldiers to deal with something in uh, Everett. So then uh, we we're just around the area. So I would stop by at Everett and uh, Community College and um, decided to you know hey I, I want to go to school because the right minute passed by the school I was like man I, I need to do something before I get out. So I went in there. Um, I did my paperwork. So I was just going to say, I'm actually back in school again. I am doing career change after seven years of working in the political field. I'm going to carpentry school over at uh, Seattle Central, and they got a really nice program over there for residential carpentry. Um, the, by the way, the vet representative while I was going here was exceptional. She really uh, knew what she was doing. But um, over there, we have a lot of veterans that come into the program. We are off campus, uh, but they don't understand all the benefits that might be available, vocational rehab, uh, worker retraining, training benefits, commissioner approved training. Um, so I just threw my name up on the whiteboard and I spent time after school helping the other veterans that are coming into the program. Uh, uh, one of our students uh, had not filed for unemployment. He just got out of the active duty. He'd been in the Navy for 14 years. Didn't think he could draw unemployment if he was going to school. Uh, thankfully we fixed that. And uh, he actually got approved for training benefits because he was a munitions expert while he was in the military. Well, that's not the band. Uh, here in the civilian world, so uh, and carpentry is in high demand, and so he met the criteria. I got him set up with that. He's actually drawing full unemployment benefits for the remainder of this year. He'll do a full year on that. Uh, I helped him walk through the really difficult side of dealing with a disability claim. Um, you know, he got out, like I said, very proud, um, and uh, didn't want to ask for help. And now I've got him on the road, getting him set up with some knee help and got him down to the VA to get uh, set up with some health coverage that, thank goodness that's offered. Uh, he had no idea that that was a, uh, something that he had. So for me, I feel like one of the things that we could fix up, there is a student uh, veteran coordinator who helps you with your enrollment, some financial aid stuff, but our social workers are so bogged down. Um, and we have a really great one named Danielle Harrison Polk who works over at Seattle Central. Um, and she comes down and spends a lot of time with the students, but it feels like there's an area that we could bridge a gap and really connect uh, veterans to services and help them navigate the bureaucracy that goes into some of this paperwork. Uh, the uh, training benefits alone is something like 40 pages to fill out and it's uh, astronomical. And I, uh, so I've been in the weeds uh, and so I'm really lucky that I get to be there and help a lot of people get through all the uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratic red tape. So. Thank you. Sylvia, 
We know that some students, uh, even though they're getting the GI Bill, they're not able to support a family. You know, even with the analysis that the new GI Bill is very generous compared to the ones, you know, when Sylvia and Larry and I were serving, and even when you were serving, because the new GI Bill is fairly recent. Uh, so they need to go into the workforce to be able to make ends meet. You know, what, what kind of uh, advice do you have for someone who is just starting, they're going to college, but they want to also enter the workforce? So I was a single mom when I started going back to school. Um, and I knew that I had to go over and beyond um, to be able to support my children, go to school, and go to work as well. And so um, I did a lot of research on scholarships and resources that were going to help me out. Um, got a few scholarships, but I also had to take out loans um, just to survive uh, as a single mom. Um, and because I continued to, to um, work hard in my studies, I was able to continue with the scholarships and, and grants and such. Um, but I think, in as far as the workforce is concerned, um, I had to learn on my own because those those resources um, weren't given to me when when I transitioned. And so I learned, um, and it's, it's it's something that I tell um, transitioning veterans and when I was helping them in City Light that they really have to, whenever they come across a job announcement, whatever job um, they're looking for, um, we talk about military occupations not transferring to the civilian workforce, and that's not true. Because the skill sets that you attain are transferable. It may not be the same title or the same kind of function, but the transferable skills that you have, whether they're managing projects, managing program, managing people, those are skill sets that are transferable into the civilian workforce. And so my advice is always break down the job announcements. Look at what you want to do. Break down the job announcements line by line and think back about what, the, what you did in the military, the skill sets that you have, and apply that. Apply that to the job announcements. And you have to, I mean, you can work with you know, resources that they provide, you know, um, the veterans resources that they provide, but in your resume, make sure you use the language that's in the job announcements and, and, trans and use your transferable skill sets. Um, because that, when, when I'm always asked to sit on resume panels and interview panels, and one of the things that I see a lot of still is you know, the military lingo, the military language and resumes. And civilian hiring managers don't understand that. They don't understand how that translates into what they're looking for. And so they'll immediately push that to the side if they, they don't they want to, they want to hire veterans, but they're not understanding how that's going to transfer into their workforce. And so they're pushed out, unfortunately. And so um, one of my goals was to create a pipeline so that we're educating hiring managers that lingo, but also helping the transitioning officers to understand what their job sets, skill sets, how they translate into the city of Seattle, and the utilities. So it's it's really doing your know, homework. It's really doing um, research, a lot of research, and and understanding how your skill sets transfer into the workforce. Whatever whatever position that you're looking into, um, understanding what your role play, what your core roles and responsibilities were in the military, how that transfers into the civilian workforce. If I could take you back, yes. um, Sylvia's. Uh, one of my friends was uh, recently involved in current change and she was doing recruiting and specifically military to civilian recruiting. So they do have headhunters that actually focus on that. So if you're in the midst of a military transition to civilian culture, one of the things that you could do is seek out those recruiters or headhunters that specialize in going from military to civilian because they're going to help you go from military speak to corporate speak. They're going to help you, you know, change those military terms to the key words that the employer is using. But yeah, just wanted to add that up. So we know, and Sylvia spoke about those skills. When it comes to the service member, now veteran, uh, it's not just the hard skills of the military occupation, but there are a lot of soft skills that are taught 
in all of the leadership academies and all of that. So what makes, you know, what makes a difference as far as the, the student who is a veteran in the classroom? What kind of impact, you know, those of you have, who have been in the classroom uh, and are a little bit older than those who normally, you know, are students, you know, how does that feel and, and, and how does the veteran contribute to the classroom atmosphere? Well, I went to school in Miami. Um, so again, I was a single mom. And um, I was really intimidated because I, ha I, I had a, a 10 year gap from when I got out of the military to when I started going back to school. And so my, my mindset was, oh my god, I'm going to have to like, be the overachiever because I'm so old, I'm going back to school, I'm going to be with 18 year olds, and I was 29 when I started. And um, I, it was, I was counseled by the college, it was Miami-Dade Community College at the time, and she says, uh, the counselor says to me, just take one class, because you've been out of school for 10 years. And I was like, oh, I've always been a good student, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna risk it and take two. And um, it came pretty easy to me, it was, it was easy. And so the next time I took five classes, and then I, I just continued that way. But it was that leadership, it was that initiative, and then I joined SGA, and then I started mentoring you know, students younger than me, and then I started motivating and inspiring other students. And so I think it was that, that military discipline, the leadership, you know, the JJ did tie buckle, Marine Corps leadership traits that <laughs> the Marine Corps is known for, and I was proud of it. And, and um, I think that relieved the intimidation that I had, I, I put it out of my mind because it wasn't intimidating going back to school, you know, as a single mom, 29, I was, you know, thinking I was so old, um, but that was my experience. I, I think there's, uh, you know, certain intangibles, veterans bring, not just to the classroom, but to employment. Uh, and. You know, I've observed that uh, quarter century in, in corporate personnel. I saw veterans coming in, you know, for a long time, and, and I recognized some of those traits. They were reliable. They were punctual. You know, they were honest. Uh, they worked well in a team. They were goal-oriented. They were mission-driven. You know, here's certain intangibles that maybe a civilian hasn't been taught. But by being in the military, those are the kinds of structure that you're accustomed to working under. Those are the expectations. You know, in the Marine Corps, they have the Marine Corps values of honor, courage, and commitment. And that means, you know, honor, you never lie, you never cheat, you never steal. You know, you're honorable, you have integrity. And when you approach a job, you know, you, you put that, you have the courage to put that honor into practice. You hold yourself accountable. You hold other people accountable. You make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, uh, you know, for the team goal, for the team mission. And of course, lastly, the uh, commitment part of it is that relentless dedication to excellence. Uh, when we're in the military, second best isn't going to get it. You know, there is no try in the Marine Corps, right? You know, when, when they say, you know, you're going to take that hill, you take the hill. That's, that's it. And I think that same attitude, those are intangibles that all of us as veterans bring to the workplace or to the classroom. I believe I told the panelists did a very good job answering that. Okay. <laughs> I think there's one thing to add also, you know, military personnel, they adapt well to change. And in the organization I'm in now, there's so much change with leadership, and, and there are folks that struggle with change. They struggle with because they so they become so accustomed to, you know, a routine. And change is hard for them. And and sometimes I sit back and I say, I wish military was required. Um, <laughs> But, but I think you know, folks who um, serve, they, they work well under pressure, they work well and adapt well to change. So Larry, what advice do you have for members of the audience uh, here tonight regarding how they can help a veteran reintegrate to the community? 
what are the things you would, you know, have them just think about in order to make that happen? Well, of course, you know, that very fundamental human instinct, be nice, you know, be nice. I mean, the veteran's going to have challenges that you're going to be able to relate to. Uh, so be patient, just be nice. Help that veteran talk their way through and help them identify what are their needs. You know, are, are there needs for training or education? Is it employment? You know, is it getting relocated, housing? Is it learning how to shop? You know, I know some young folks, myself, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. You know, when I came out, uh, signing up for phone and heat and all this other stuff, going to the grocery store. There were some real basic necessities that maybe I wasn't really well equipped with because the Marine Corps gave me my housing, they gave me my food, they gave me my clothes. I didn't have to go and hustle that stuff. I had this built-in structure already. So be nice, help that veteran understand what are the needs. And then there's places, thankfully nowadays, there's a lot of places, you know, Elfie runs a wonderful shop. She is, you know, a champion for veterans, second to none. She leads our nation in, in being a, a veteran leader. But there are, are uh, so many resources within the human college system or colleges and universities, vocational schools. They have veteran counselors. Um, in employment arenas and, and things like Sylvia's doing, uh, recognizing the veteran needs and the transition into uh, public employment. You know, so there's lots of resources. Help them identify the needs and then connect them. Uh, not only are there VA or the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs, but there are veteran service organizations. Uh, I'm a member of the Puget Sound Marine Corps League and uh, the Marine Corps League and the Marine Corps have a formal partnership. It's called Honorary Active Duty. And when a Marine is scheduled to be released from active duty into the civilian world, we hook up with them when we say, look, we'll pay your first year membership dues in the Marine Corps League. And you can be around other Marines. You know, we have Marines that were uh, from Iwo Jima and Korea and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. And, um, we can help you. We can, we've been through it. We've had to apply for VA benefits. We've had to apply for education. We've had to go, you know, do that resume or do that job interview. So there's that structure they're accustomed to. You know, one veteran talking to another, you can say things in shorthand and you don't have to explain it like you do as a veteran. The mostly don't get it. But, uh, so there's the Marine Corps League, the BFW, AMVETS, American Legion, you know, I could go on and on. There's lots of veteran service organizations, there's vet centers, there's VAs, and one plug I'll put in is for Washington Service, that's capital W, capital A, Washington Service. This is an online tool. You go in there and you put in your name and you say, this is what I need. And, and that program will screen all the resources and they will have the right fit. They will have the person who can deliver that service you need contact you. So instead of you having to go through, you know, 150 different resources, this program does that for you. Washington serves, don't forget it. So you have a neighbor, young family that moves next to you, you know, they kind of look military because they still have, you know, have the short hair cut and all. You know, they're your neighbor. You know, you're moving to that community. You know, is it okay for somebody to knock on your door and, you know? I had uh, just moved up into, uh, back up to Shoreline, just uh, about almost two years ago. Um, that first Veterans Day, I had my army flag flying high out in the front, and I opened up my door later that afternoon and I'm not saying beer was exactly what I was looking for, but there was a lot of beer on my uh, front door. And there was a bunch of notes from my neighbors uh, saying, thank you for your service. And without any name attached to it whatsoever. Um, that just made me really feel good and safe in my community. 
Um, I'm really fortunate to have wonderful neighbors, but absolutely. Uh, I, you know, one of the things that we do in my neighborhood is we do uh, a couple of annual get-togethers, um, and which I just highly recommend. It's good to know your neighbors. Um, and I would say uh, definitely, I, I love it when people come up and want to talk to me about the service. I'm proud of my service. Uh, you know, I, I feel for Larry's generation not having that opportunity to talk about it because um, for me, the next getting married to my wife, it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think you should go up and say hello. So I'm going to stop right here the uh, you know panel questions and just give an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have of the panel members. You can follow them by name or put a question if you are not particularly keen on. Yes. Hey, actually, I have a question for you, Sergeant Baker. Um, my name is Jerry. Um, I'm a former six eight kilo lab tech um, on the army. I work under Missy Anderson, the VR uh, veterans coordinator here at uh, Shoreline Community College. Uh, we have a spate of students here at Shoreline Community College who are veterans who are also medical personnel. We found difficulty transitioning our medical experience to um, our, to relevant or equivalent certification here in Washington State. Do you know any resources or offices in the area that can allow us to sit down somebody to do so? The Department of Health has been a mixed help. Like as you said, bureaucracy is kind of a difficult bit worse. Yeah, and I, you know, that's, a, and probably, you know, some of the members of the panel can answer uh, some of that, you know, but certifications are hard because depending on the service, um, uh, some services will provide more training than others and therefore can meet a lot of the thresholds for, you know, for recognition of the occupational specialty. As an example, someone who worked in a ship, cutting hair. And that was kind of their occupational specialty. They were a barber. The Department of Licensing will give them a barber, so beauty completion <coughs> license upon completion of service because they met all of the requirements. You know, same thing with X-ray technicians. If they were Army or trained by the Army, you know, in the Navy they have some shortfalls in the time, you know, the length of time. But we can talk about that separately if uh, you know, like you'd like to do that. But the Department of Health is doing a lot of work, licensing and labor and industries in recognizing apprenticeship. A lot of work and laws have been passed over the last five years to be able to ensure that all of that experience and service is recognized and people don't have to start from scratch. Because that is the most frustrating thing for a veteran, isn't it? Veterans don't have any patience. Uh, we're not patient. We want to be able to get start work yesterday, you know, and it can be frustrating and debilitating and depressing. You know, any one of you want to talk about that? I, I would note that I've worked uh, both on the uh, uh, national side and I worked for Congress uh, a couple different times and I've also worked on the state side. Um, Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, your local congressperson, they're bogged down with phone calls. But I'm going to be honest with you, your state representatives do not get the phone calls uh, like anybody else. And uh, I'm sure Ruth Kagi and uh, uh, Representative Ryu would be very happy to hear this information. But I would say get together your own lobby group. You know, get some people that are very interested in getting this thing through and go talk to your state senator, go talk to your state representatives. I guarantee you, Congress gets probably a million phone calls, they're getting like three. Uh, and you can get a meeting with these people and get it. If, if it's not getting on their portfolio, something they care about, that you got constituent, they care about votes. Money's first, then the constituency seems to be the second thing. I'm telling you, give them a call and get some people together that are very, sounds like you and you have a good understanding of this object. Put it on their palate. Yeah. And when somebody says, oh, I was just an infantry man, what do you tell them? So I, I, I would say, be a trailblazer. If it's not done, be the first to do it because there is always a first. When I first got here to Washington, it was supposed to be a nine month mentorship with my program in New York City. And I realized really quickly that the city of Seattle as an organization, veterans were not visible at all. And that bothered me a lot. And I had to choose a thesis. And at the time I was working for corporate performance director and she dealt with performance metrics and you know reporting and, and that was not going to be what I was going to work on. I knew that my mission was to make veterans visible. And so I set out and, and I would knock on people's doors and, and um, the, the veteran booklets that, that, um, that the department gives, the uh, Veteran Affairs, it's a, it's a little booklet of benefits. 
I wanted to order those, and I sent an email out, and I would never get a response. I, I ended up carrying it in my back pocket every single day until I saw the human resources officer walking towards the elevator, and I stopped her. I said, can I order these? And she goes, yes, I've gone back to my desk per you know, human resource officer, please order. You have to do what you have to do to be that trailblazer. And, and five, six years later, they are now celebrating Memorial Day celebrations. They've made this, you know, um, veterans visible. They're working with transitioning officers. So I say, don't let that stop you. You be the trailblazer. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about um, the cultural aspect. Uh, so uh, military, I come from a family of uh, lots of military folks. My grandfather served in World War II. But I also know that um, Part of the transition out, you're going back into your community as a Latina. I think that that's also an important aspect, and I would love for you all to talk about um, that part of who you are. That I can be part. <laughs> well, uh, now that you mentioned it, I'm working on a. a project right now, Filipino American Vietnam War Vets, and we're doing an oral history in conjunction with the Filipino National Historical Society. So we've got uh, 19 veterans here in this local area who grew up together. Some went to grade school, some went to middle school, some went to high school. We all served in Vietnam. Some were uh, helicopter pilots. Uh, some were gunners on helicopters, uh, others rescued down pilots. We had grunts, truck drivers, communications, the whole gamut. The thing is, we knew each other growing up, and we worked side by side. And some of us volunteered in the same community-based organizations. But not once, not once in 50 years did we ever talk about the these are my good friends, these are my brothers, and not once. So, it was, I think, uh, three veteran days ago, we were uh, at the University of Washington for the Filipino American Student Association, and they had a veteran panel. And we were looking at each other, we're going, wow, there's like 15 of us standing here. Because, you know, we've never talked about this, maybe we should get together and do our oral history which then turned into us doing a, a audio visual and recording all of that. So we're just getting at the end of wrapping that up. Uh, but that was really important. Uh, in the city of Seattle, all, uh, because of the era I come from and veterans um, were looked down upon. Uh, but I did start, uh, uh, Filipino American City Employees of Seattle in 1990. And uh, we helped uh, PASE, the Hispanic uh, American City Employees, get going. We got the LGBTs going. Uh, blacks in government was going pretty strong. But we built bridges and uh, we got city dollars for training. And uh, we were trying to break those what we call, I call it bamboo ceilings, uh, where, you know, we were always like the best technician, we were always the best accountant, but we were never the supervisor, we were never the manager. And uh, so we worked in, in enhancing our visibility and underscoring our strengths and our skills and our contributions and saying, hey, look, it, we're here too. Uh, you know, I might just add, uh, I recently was on the uh, Academy Board for Congresswoman Jaya Paul. Um, it was a really nice honor. I was a listed guy, so actually to be able to choose who's going to be the new officers was extremely exciting for me. We interviewed about 30 different candidates uh, from all around the district. Um, I want to say it was about 50-50. Can you explain what that means? The Academy because, nomination? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, so, so we have uh, West Point, Annapolis, uh, the Coast Guard uh, Academy, which is uh, Kings Point, I think it was the, uh, the, the Air Force Academy out of Colorado. Um, when these students are coming from uh, high school and getting ready to go into their next phase of life and they want to become an officer, some of them choose to go to academy, uh, to academies. Uh, there's, a there's a lot of different academies. These are the big prestigious academies, West Point, Annapolis, and the Air Force Academy, and of course, Kings Point. But 
Um, they choose uh, people to live in the community to interview these children. And these are exceptional people. We're talking uh, heavily involved in the community, uh, perfect straight A students, um, extremely charismatic, uh, very competitive uh, for these slots. We only can give nominations to those that uh, deserve it, um, but we get a, to choose a principal nomination. Uh, the principal nomination means if I choose uh, candidate X to go off to uh, West Point and I put them at the top of the list, as long as they pass the physical, West Point has to take this person. Um, the board that I served on had uh, two women of color, um, uh, as well as uh, a retired uh, Navy captain, and I was really uh, honored that uh, the congresswoman asked me to be on the uh, panel. We went into that, um, and we interviewed all these children, and thought we had actually had six slots, principal nominations that we could fill. We had a couple extra slots from a previous year where somebody maybe didn't make it into the uh, West Point and Annapolis. Out of those six slots, five of those we filled with female candidates, not just because we were trying to fill them with female candidates. These were the exceptional candidates that needed to go to the academies. Um, and uh, just as somebody who's an infantryman, I served two deployments uh, in an all-male unit. Washington State now has four female infantrymen uh, uh, serving in its ranks. I just found that out from his battalion commander who I served with in my first uh, deployment. And uh, the other, and what I want to say about that is, I think that's exceptional. I served with two female medics on my last deployment. They were the strongest, headstrong, um, exceptional soldiers I've ever had the pleasure of serving with. And both of them had wanted to be infantry. And uh, I'm just really glad that we're kind of getting to a point where we're getting all of those opportunities. And let alone the fact that we're going to get some really neat, uh, really exceptional leaders going into these academies. I wanted to answer your question as a Latina. So. Um, so, in the city of Seattle, you mentioned the different affinity groups, they're called affinity groups now. Um, I am a part of the African American affinity group and the uh, Hispanic and Latino affinity group. Um, but in addition to that, the city of Seattle is also very committed to race and social justice to um, eliminate institutionalized racism. And so I also serve on the core team and change team uh, for the city and for SPU respectively. And so um, there are a lot of disparities of people of color, um, regardless of veteran status. But we do know that um, homelessness of, in, impacts women of color from veterans um, from, who are separated veterans. Um, so we're being more diligent about using a racial lens <clears throat> on our hiring practices, on our disciplinary practices, on just the workforce in of itself, so that we minimize the disparities amongst people of color. Um, so to answer your question, I hope that answers your question. And uh, I don't know if you know, but the military is probably one of the most diverse entities in the world, you know, when it comes to, to the US military. And because we have so many service members remaining here in Washington State after military service, or people who served here went all over the world or went back home after you know active duty, and they just went. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Tennessee. <laughs> you know, my family really likes Washington State, and they come back to Washington State. You know that continues to you know to increase the diversity you know and uh, the color of the workforce and students because they come with the GI Bill you know and therefore continue to sprinkle our colleges and universities you know with that much needed richness of diversity you know so that's one of the contributions also that the military does you know in addition to being so integrated so I have a question for John. What sort of things of self-help, you know, can you recommend to those who are in transition? Because, you know, there's a lot of programs and all of that, but what, what should veterans seek to be able to help themselves? Um, I know I already kind of told you a little bit about my story. Um, I only heard this about a month ago. I was actually drywalling my old company commanders upstairs, and, um, and we were talking afterwards for dinner, and. Uh, I've lost a couple of friends to suicide that I've served with, um, but he blew me away when he told me that eight members of my company have committed suicide since 2005 when we got back from Iraq. I mean, that's a lot. And uh, so, 
for me, going uh, coming back and, and, and going to therapy, I mean, it saved my life. I was dead down a very long, uh, bad road. Um, I doubt I would have made it. Uh, and so for my self-help, it, it really, it took having a peer, somebody that I really respected, uh, being honest with me and open. And so what, one of the things I would say as far as self-help, uh, therapy worked for me. Um, I, I'm really also grateful that we have these uh, community-based clinics now that we have with the VA. So I don't have to drive all the way to Beacon Hill to get some uh, health care. Um, and they've been exceptional. And they don't pedal push uh, prescriptions on me. Uh, they're really trying to find out uh, what I need to be a healthy human being. And so as far as self-help, I would say uh, having people in my community that are willing to maybe even share, you know, we all have different stories, but we've all needed help at some point in our life. And so I would say if you see a veteran um, uh, that might be going through a tough time, um, get them connected to some service organizations that Larry talked about. I send a lot of people to Disabled American Veterans. It's just one of the organizations that I absolutely love uh, down in the federal building. And uh, uh, just let them feel uh, uh, welcomed, uh, but at the same time, maybe go home, do a little research, call these veteran organizations, say, hey, I think there might be somebody that needs some help. And uh, so that's what I would offer. I could add to that. Um, Self-help for me is I keep myself busy. Uh, right when I got out, I didn't really have nothing to do. I was bored, you know, as in when you're bored, you start thinking about, like, man, what, why am I doing this? You know, I should have gone back to the military. So what I did, I kept myself busy, so I, I went being active. I was active in the military. I was in the infantry, so we always work out. So what I did, I, I went hiking. Um, and I share my story with my family, so they, they are my support instead of going to therapy. So I use that, I, I use my family and my friends as my support. So I kept myself busy, along with that I kept myself busy, so, so I would be like, you know, because I was active in the military, so might as well stay active. So I went, I went fishing, camping, um, well, just to uh, keep my mind clear, um, I I compete in a shooting competition to keep myself busy. Meet like black-minded people that likes uh, the same thing as me. You know, I, I ride motorcycles. I meet people that that are veterans and that aren't veterans. But you know, we we have the same passion for motorcycles, so we kind of connect. So I kind of sh share my story. Uh, to them, so we kind of like, all right, man. Like, I never knew about the military, and I would, I share my my um, my experience, and yeah, that would be my self help. Keep myself busy and uh, have your family closer to you, you know, before you go to you know, see other means of resources. So we have uh, Sylvia. Yes. Oh, um, actually, it brings a good question. One of the things I like about being a veteran is the fact that it actually supersedes like all these uh, all the politics today. When you see other veterans that trust, that trust, you guys have been through the same travails, the same uh, trials. You know that that person has a, a measure of credibility. Even in the community, there are still divides, especially when we see older veterans and younger veterans. How can we, as younger veterans, reach out to those and older veterans? Like I know that in the area, there's been diminished uh, involvement in VFW and other older veteran organizations. How can we reach out? I say get involved. I say make yourself visible, push yourself out there. Um, there are, I, you mentioned the Marine Corps League. I mean, I, know, I only know the Marine Corps. That's branch. But I, I say just go out there and, and so when I was in City Light, trying to identify the different resources um, so that I could provide that to the veterans to make them, to inspire them to, to self-identify, because that's one of the things that I find a lot here is that folks don't self-identify because of that Vietnam sentiment and pushback, because with it, Seattle is high, well, has been highly industrialized and technical, and so um, but we have found that they're, they're self-identifying more, and, and if there isn't, start one. Again, it's that trailblazing where you go into a space where there isn't something that you see a need for, create one, make it visible, put it on Facebook, social media, put it, you know, send it to the city of Seattle, send it to different organizations, because there are a lot of private sector businesses that are very supportive, and very uh, veteran friendly, like Starbucks. Reach out to them 
and, and I performed an environmental scan, which is I listed all of the different resources that I personally found on the list, and I started passing that out to hiring managers, to veterans, so that they could do, you know, and add to the list. So I say, just be more visible. Get out there to the community. Get out there. Call the different organizations. Call the different corporations because most of them have veteran, um, veteran, um, not recruiters, but uh, contacts um, for that transition, that transitional pipeline. I was going to add, um, you know, when I worked in Congress, and I know this is going to blow everybody away, but I actually quit it because of ethics. Uh, <laughs> I was too confined by ethics. Uh, somebody would call in for help, and I would know exactly what to do to help them, but I couldn't do it the way I wanted to do it. I couldn't be like, hey, call Charlie. This dude knows how to take care of you with Asian orange exposure. Um, when I worked with Congress, I learned a lot about the bureaucracy and kind of how to get around that red tape. Uh, so when I actually left that, I joined a VFW. Um, and I was helping a lot of people that were coming out our age that were going through disability claims at that time. Um, but now I help a lot of my Korean War veterans and my Vietnam veterans uh, work through, uh, you know, they might have gotten cancer, they might have got diabetes. And I'll tell you what, when you've got a veteran who's living on a fixed income, worried about their housing, maybe he's going to die of terminal cancer, and you have the energy to sit down and work through that paperwork with them, you'll be a hero to that person. Um, and I absolutely, as a veteran, go join a VFW, go join an American Legion, somebody, meet these older veterans and provide a little bit of support for them because they feel very alone at this moment. So. You know, and all people are stuck in their ways. We know that, don't we? Those who are over the age of 65. Yes, we do. You know, and sometimes it's hard to be able to make that connection, you know, because of, uh, you know, just because of the chasm, you know, in there between ages and all that. There's a, that differential. But the fact is that there's so many things in common. And I can tell you, one of the areas where we've seen the young and the old kind of come together is through biking, motorcycles. And not even motorcycles, now they're bicycling clubs, which is a lot easier. You know, you don't have to be on that big bike and be able to organize bicycle rides, you know, and, and that's a way of being able to get, you know, some of that action going because young veterans don't like to go to EMW halls for meetings. Young veterans want to do stuff. And if we start getting the old people doing stuff, you know, and not doing the meetings, I think there's going to be a lot more interaction and it's going to be far more beneficial for the older veteran to be out there doing things and being busy in addition to the meetings, which are okay. You know. <laughs> well, you know, the veteran service organizations just don't meet. For instance, the Marine Corps Lake has a rose program. We go out and hand out roses, uh, which is like the BMW poppies, and we accept donations. That money goes into helping uh, our Wounded Warrior Regiment, which is uh, a regiment of the U.S. Marine Corps, but also uh, we have a program, Marines Helping Marines. So that money gets distributed around the hospitals all over the United States. And then we take a portion of that money in our Marine Support Fund to help local veterans. It might be something as simple as the veteran says, you know what, I'm in between jobs and I'm going to be homeless if I can't cover my rent for the next three months. So I've just got this short term financial thing. You know, we'll come up with that four or five thousand dollars and we'll pay that rent. It's not a loan. We just want to make sure they know, you know, you never leave a Marine behind, that you're always there. And if it's another branch of service, then we engage the VFW or the American Legion that shares the same facility with us. And we'll chip in for them. And, you know, we'll just get it going. Even with the inter service rivalry, the veterans are veterans, you know. <laughs> You know, we're, we're all on the same team, we've all been there, so. Uh, there's Toys for Tots. Every year we, we collect money and we collect thousands and tens of thousands of toys. Uh, the VFW, I go down and I help them pack uh, support packages, sending them overseas to active duty that are serving in harm's way. You know, there's lots of things you can do besides going to a meeting, so. Uh, meetings are okay for some of us, but uh, there's great positive activities where you can perform a community service
that's not only helping the veteran, but the veteran's family. So we're almost at the final stretch in here, and I have one almost final question in here. What do you miss the most about the military? And that's for each one of you. So, so they'll know what is it that, you know, you're not no longer there, but what is the one thing if you were to put your, you know, your thoughts into it that you miss the most? Who wants to start? I'll, uh, I miss playing spades and dominoes. Uh, <laughs> I really miss it. Um, I, I would say, uh, and I think everybody up here is probably going to say the camaraderie, uh, uh, just really knowing that the person next to you has your back. Uh, you know, you go to your jobs every day, I go to work, and uh, you know, like at work, I might count on somebody to kind of, you know, pick up the, you know, some slack for me and whatnot, but to have somebody standing right next to me that's willing to even take a bullet to save my life, and me for them, I don't even know if I can put into words what that is. Um, and so, I, I do miss some of the structure. Uh, I am back now working in carpentry, so I swear a lot more like I did when I was in the military. <laughs> um, so I enjoyed that, but uh, yeah, I would say, just knowing that I had somebody cover my uh, my sins. Yeah, I have to I have to um, second that. Uh, just knowing that um, your brother or sister in arms, they, they can relate to your experience firsthand. They know without you even having to say anything what you're going through, and I think that's a hard one of the hardest parts about the transition. That when you go into the civilian workforce, you don't readily find someone who can understand your experience. You can't even articulate it. Um, but in the military, you're with people. You don't even have to articulate it. They just get it. And um, I think teamwork, I think that just knowing that you have a mission to accomplish and you're just going to get it done together with minimal resources, you're just going to get it done. You're going to be creative and you just do it, right? Um, I miss that because, you know, here it's like, can you please get the work done? Um, I don't have resources. You don't need resources. You have a paper clip. Get it done. Um, you need diaper. Um, so I, I, I miss that. I really do miss that. Uh, what I miss is uh, road marching, uh, 34 miles. <laughs> <laughs> what I miss uh, being out of the military is, the, like we said, the camaraderie. Most of the time, I end the structure. You know, I wake up at this time, at this time, I do this, do that, this, this, this. That's what I miss. Um, I miss being held accountable for my action when I messed up. But you know, I, I'm free now. So. <laughs> uh, what else did I miss? I, I miss the guys that I work with, not, not the things that. Yeah, uh, I, I miss being pushed uh, physically and mentally. Mentally, I, I like to be pushed mentally because you know it's it's a test of human limits. You know? I, I never experienced that if I didn't join the military. The mental capacity, mental toughness, and physical uh, toughness. Uh, that's what I miss. I guess miss being a U.S. Marine. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they say there's really uh, only two military branches: the Army and the Navy. The Air Force is a corporation, and the Marine Corps is a cult. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a sense of duty. It's, you know, I'm, I'm a servant leader. When I was working, I did a lot of community based organizations, a lot of volunteerism with uh, human services and performing arts and what have you. You know, so, so there's, there's a sense of giving back to the community because I feel, you know, gainful employment, a livable wage. I need to give back and help out my community. But, when I was in uniform, you know, it was that greater sense of duty, that patriotism, that we're giving back to our country. My father immigrated from the Philippines uh, in the 1920s, and I have a sense that he gave my father the opportunity, my family the opportunity, and I need to give back to this country. So that sense of duty. I also I'm not a free spirit. I need that structure around me for me to function a little better. And, and I like that structure. The clarity of missions, you know. Uh, I didn't have to, you know, start with a blank piece of paper every morning. My mission was clear, and I was driven. Uh, what we call gung ho in the Marine Corps, that's working together. That sense of uh, uh, 
working the team with other Marines, you know, paperclip, hey, improvise, adapt, and overcome. And you, you carry that the rest of your life. Whenever you need a challenge, it's like, hey, great, here's a chance to improvise. Here's a chance to adapt. You just carry that with you. Uh, there was some training, there was the leadership aspects that I wouldn't have, you know, received as a 17 or 18 or 19 year old in the civilian world. And then uh, all of the assignments and, and the travel that I had, I really enjoyed that. So, uh, lots of good things about being in the military. I also just wanted to jump in and, and say uh, thank you so much for uh, passing that King County Veterans Levy. Because uh, I'm about ready to go back to my uh, board next month and we're going to spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So let me just tell you for me, all of that what was opening my closet and looking at six or six pieces of clothes that look exactly the same. <laughs> I don't have to worry about what kind of monkey suit I'm going to be wearing <laughs> for the next day. That was the one thing that, you know, that I really miss having a uniform. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll ask you a question. I'm retired Seattle Fire. We appreciate our military. When they come in, uh, it's nice having that sense of purpose and the drive. A question, do you think that we would be helped in the long run as Americans by reinstituting the draft <coughs> rather than relying totally on uh, volunteers? Um, uh, I'll answer that. Um, yes, uh, because uh, the, with that, they would help us uh, be, you know, we the experience, like the experience that I had, and the experience that they had, we were able to understand each other. Like, I'm with it, but you know, yeah, I, I'm with the draft. So, just to, I, I would actually culture. take the opposite end of it. Uh, you know, I, I graduated from Shorecrest High School, not far from here. They do an exceptional Veterans uh, Day assembly over there. It's really wonderful that I get to go to. I gave a speech there one time where I was talking to the students, and I told them that while it was right for me in the service that I did, um, I challenged them to find some type of service. I don't think the military is right for everybody, but I think that getting out there, out of your community, and getting involved uh, with a Peace Corps, uh, I have uh, some interns that went to work for FEMA, uh, they make no money. Um, but I think getting out of your community and your comfort zone is one of the best educations you can get. So while I don't think that the military might be right for everybody, I do think service is right for everybody. And I think getting out of your comfort zone and seeing how others live would be extremely beneficial. Yeah. AmeriCorps is another one that is really going strong right now. You know, and uh, yeah, opportunities for service are not just the military. You know, serving is serving. And everybody has a chance to be able to do that, no matter what. Well, thank and, you for your service. Oh. Thank, you. thank you. Any thank other you. questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I'm a member of the Washington Fly Fishing Club. And one of our subunits is the Project Healing Water Group. Uh, we have more fun than the best do there, I must say. <laughs> but we teach. Any vet that wants to come, uh, there's a unit down at American Lake, and then we work out of the Compass House in Renton, across from the high school there. Uh, Tuesday morning, 10 to 11.30 roughly, uh, we teach vets. Well, we don't teach them that much anymore, but the first batch we had to teach them. Uh, teach them how to tie flies. And some of them had trouble with their fingers. Uh, after a while, they started improving. I had one fellow who was a uh, World War II that was in the retirement section of the Seattle VA Hospital. He came in in January and started working. I had to set the vice up for him. I had to put the book in. A lot of times they have to help him finish the fly. But working with him, he kept at it. In the next first part of December, I said, Hey, Bill, how about trying a Christmas tree pattern today? And he said, Okay. And I went 
get the theater there because it's just made of this fun theater there. Wanted to get the stuff, and he already had his bike set up and put it in. His hands were so much better. And I showed him how to, to do a few spins of the deer hair. And he turned away and came back, and he had the whole thing. It's a big bush, and he had to trim it down in the shape of a Christmas tree. And he did it. You know, activity is the mother of health. And when our veterans, especially elder veterans, uh, stay busy, their health improves. It's the same thing. It doesn't have to be somebody age. A lot of our young veterans have gone through a lot. You know, and they need activity that is going to be able to kind of restore the soul. And that's where many of you are so important in being able to identify to know who's in the community. We have about 600,000 veterans in Washington State. Over 138,000 in King County alone. Nearly 2 million family members of those veterans. 65,000 active duty we serve, you know, uh, in, in the state of Washington. Anywhere you look, several houses down, there's probably a veteran or the family of a veteran. And therefore, the work that we do as a community, community, you know, it's going to be able to improve the quality of life of vets. So take a chance in being able to ask the question, did you serve in the military? If you have some suspicion of it and all that, and then invite them for dinner, a cup of coffee to your house, you know, your neighbor and all, because, you know, that's sometimes the first step in being able to maybe identify somebody, you know, in trouble. So I just want to say thank you again for everything that, you know, for, for being here today, for sharing. Thank you to our great panel. These are incredible people. Let's just give them a hand. <laughs>